you ever had a wild day or a crazy day or just maybe bizarre day or maybe it wasn't even just a wild day it was a wild moment Jessica and I we are taking dog well we are not taking the dog training classes we are taking our dog to the dog training classes and so we did that this afternoon and we were reminded of a story we had with our dog five four years ago and uh, we were uh, on another side of our house I can't I think we were making dinner or something and we heard the dog rustling with paper and we thought, what is the dog doing? And, I, and Jessica was like, do we need to go try? And I was like, nah, dog's fine, dog's fine. Well, we go in to the living room, and the dog had eaten, I won't say what the dog had eaten, but the dog had eaten 28 pills. Um, I'll let you figure out what that is um, later. But, and so we had to figure out, how do we figure out what this dog, like, to take care of this dog? The solution to get a dog to throw up pills, you feed it hydrogen peroxide. And so we fed the dog hydrogen peroxide in the bathtub. And I mean, it was just a crazy and wild evening at our house, let me tell you. And so a wild and crazy day. We all have those just wild days where just things happen and we are just like, this will make for a great story in five years or 10 years after the fact. Or we have wild and crazy days where the alarm goes off late and so we are late getting up, we're late getting for work and we finally get out the door and then we realize the kid has, lo- has left their lunch money at, at home so you have to go take the lunch money. While you're then going to work, the tire goes flat and you have to stop and change the tire. All the while you get to work, then you realize you forgot the project that you were supposed to be, I mean it just goes on and on and on. And you have that kind of wild day. Or like I said, you have the wild day where things happen and they are just bizarre. They just don't happen in your normal day. And so tonight we're going to talk about a wild day in the life of Jesus. And it wasn't necessarily a wild day because his alarm clock didn't go off at the right time. And it wasn't a wild day because Peter forgot his lunch money. Instead, it is a wild day in the life of Jesus because of what all takes place. It's a wild day because a lot of stuff happened and it was a lot of crazy things that normally don't happen to us. And so we're going to be in Luke chapter 8 the entire evening and so you can be turning there, clicking there, or uh, however you are reading tonight. But we're going to be in Luke chapter 8 verse 22. Luke chapter 8, verse 22, and you can see the first two words there in verse 22, it says, one day. And if you look through the rest of chapter 8, never once does it say the next day or another day. Now, I don't know if these next three stories that we're going to be talking about tonight all occurred on one day. Uh, It's quite possible they probably didn't, but as he's writing this, lumps these stories together for a purpose. And what we're going to see is that these stories all have common themes. That there's a a commonality between all of these stories. And it's not just geographically, but they are connected through a common theme. And what I mean by that is they are all accounts of Jesus performing miracles. They show Jesus' power. And so tonight we're going to be looking at this day, so to speak, in the life of Jesus and just see how wild it is. We're going to look from uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 22, all the way to the end of the chapter. And so let's begin in Luke 8, verse 22. It says, One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. Jesus fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went to him and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. 
Very common story. We all know it quite well. But I want us to look at a few things in this story. So the storm comes up. The disciples go. They wake up Jesus and say they are going to drown. Jesus calms the storm. And then the first of two questions in this story is asked. And it come, the first one comes from Jesus. And he says, where is your faith? And we're going to come back to that in a sec. But notice it says, and then it says, in fear and amazement, they asked, who is this? That's the second question. But notice it says that they were not afraid, or it never says they were afraid when the storm came up on the boat. Now, they, they say to Jesus, we're going to drown. So you assume, okay, they're obviously concerned about the situation. But it says they asked, who is this, in fear and amazement. The only time in this story that it says that they were afraid is when they were asking, who is Jesus? It was when they had seen the power of Christ. And so let's go back to Jesus' question to them where he says, where is your faith? I don't think Jesus is necessarily asking them, where is your faith in the sense of why are you afraid of this storm? I think he's asking it in the sense of, what do you think about me? And it's very similar to what he's going to ask them in chapter 9, verse 20, when he speaks to Peter and he says, who do you say I am? And so the disciples' question of, who is this man? Jesus is asking, where is your faith in this way of, who do you think I am? And the disciples are in fear and amazement of Jesus, and they're asking, who is this? Who is this man that we just got in a boat with? And so there's fear and awe about Christ because he has this power over the winds and the seas. You see, in ancient culture, the seas were evil forces that brought storms upon sailors. There were Greek gods that controlled the seas. But here, this man in the flesh is controlling the seas. And so where is this faith? Where is their faith? Are these 12 disciples going to recognize that Jesus is from God and is God? Where is their faith? Where do they stand in what they believe about who Jesus is? And so already in this first story, we've, we're introduced to two ideas that we're going to see throughout the rest of Luke chapter 8. And it's this idea of fear and this idea of faith. And faith is this idea of where do you believe or where do you stand on who Jesus is? Do you believe that Jesus is just a man? Do you believe that he's just a good person? Do you believe that Jesus is the son of God and is thus God and has control over, in this instance, the natural world? And what we're going to see here in a sec, other realms. And so now we move on to the next miracle story. The same day, possibly, like I said, we don't really know. But Luke introduces this section with the idea of one day. It says they go from Jesus' Jesus's power over natural forces, over the natural world, like the wind and the waves. And we're now going to transition to Jesus' power over spiritual forces, over the spiritual world. Luke chapter 8, verse 26, it says, They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his, top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you. Don't torture me. Talking about a wild day. They go across the lake after seeing Jesus calm the storms. Now they're introduced to this naked screaming man in the tombs. And what I want us to notice about this demon possessed man is to contrast what he says in verse 28 to what the disciples say in verse 25. The man says, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? And the disciples say, who is this man? 
the disciples still questioning. The demon-possessed man acknowledging through the demons who Jesus is. So continuing on, verse 29 says, For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken into his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And then the people went to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. In my opinion, one of the saddest verses right there in the entire Bible. That these people are afraid of Jesus and push him away. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the whole healing and the interaction here. But I want us, what I want us to notice about this miracle story is showing Jesus' power over the spiritual world. We've had Jesus' power over the natural world in the previous verses. And now, in this miracle story, we have Jesus' power over the spiritual world. And so we have this theme building of Jesus' power, that Jesus has power over these different forces and showing that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is God and is from God. But there's this other theme building, and it's in verse 37, when it says, Then all of the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. The disciples saw the power of Jesus in verse 25, and they said, in fear and amazement, they asked, who is this man? The disciples had fear when they saw the power of Jesus, but they stuck with Jesus. They did not push Jesus away, but this crowd, this city, this town, they see the power of Jesus, and they have fear, and they push him away. They ask him to leave. You see, Jesus had messed up their life. He messed up the life of the people who live in the town. They knew how to handle this demon-possessed man. They knew, yeah, we put him in chains, we put him on the outskirts of town, we put him in the tombs, we kind of ignore him. But now Jesus has healed this man, and there's kind of this, okay, what do we do with him now? What do we do with, do we welcome this man back into our town? Do we share a meal with him? And so there's this this kind of almost fear of that. But then also, there's the economic loss. Remember those pigs? There was a herd of pigs that the demons went into and they drowned. There's a loss with those pigs. When Jesus comes into our lives, He changes things. He changes our life. He changes how we act. Marty talked about this this morning, that we are now a holy people. We have to learn what that looks like. Our life, our, our economic situation might even get messed up because Jesus asks us to sell all that we have, give to the poor, and come follow Him. Jesus takes our world and turns it upside down. And that might invoke fear in us a little bit. And so the question is, how do we handle that fear? How do we handle that now that Jesus has turned our life upside down? Do we push Him away? Or do we stick with Him? Do we choose to follow Jesus and react in faith? Or do we push Him away? It's been quite a day for the disciples. They were in a storm. They saw a man healed of demons. 
but it's not over yet. They've still got two more miracle stories to go. And these are in verses 40 through 56. But we're actually not going to look at them in the order they appear. We're going to look at them individually. And so the interactions, basically. And so we're going to start in 42, halfway through verse 42, with one interaction. The interaction with the sick woman. It says, as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. People are crowding around. People are wanting to see Jesus. People are wanting to interact with Jesus. And a woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. So this woman has been bleeding for 12 years. She is considered unclean by the Jewish law. She's unclean. She goes to Jesus. She touches his cloak and is instantly healed. And there's a lot in this story that we could look at. We could talk about how no one even noticed this woman. That they completely just got distracted. Didn't notice the hurting woman. But I want us to notice what Jesus says to this woman. In verse 28, Jesus says, Your faith has healed you. Which if we go back to verse 25, Jesus asks the disciples, where is your faith? Which was a question of what do you believe about me? What do you believe about me? Who do you believe I am? Where do you stand in your belief about me? And here this woman shows that she had faith. She believed that Jesus was God in human form and had the power to heal her. And so we've seen Jesus show power over the natural world. He showed power over the spiritual world. And now he's also shown power over the physical world. Three stories so far showing the power of Jesus. That he has power over different realms of this world. Realms that man, we can barely even understand. And Jesus has power over them. He shows dominion over them that he is from God and is God. So where is our faith? Where do we stand? What do we believe about Jesus? Well, you look at these stories and you get your answer. So let's look at one more. The final miracle story in this section, going back to verse 40 through 42. It says, Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him. So this is after uh, healing of the man possessed by demons. They've come back across the lake. It says, a crowd welcomed him for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. And then jump down to verse 49. We have the interaction with Jesus and the sick woman. It says, While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the, che- the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. 
Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. This is the final miracle story in this section. A girl of about 12 years old, and if you notice, the same amount of time that the woman had been bleeding. But notice... Jesus' command, don't be afraid, just believe. Two things we're, we've been looking at, two themes in these four stories. This idea of fear and this idea of faith. Again, we have this message of fear, which we've been seeing in all of the miracle stories, and this idea of faith as well. And so one day... Four miracles and two ideas, faith and fear. But what do we get out of this story? Where do we go from here? Well, we see the importance of recognizing who Jesus is. Recognizing that He is the Son of God and that we need to put our faith in Him. Because when we put our faith in Him... He will calm whatever storms of life we are going through. When we put our faith in Him, He will get rid of any demons we might have in our life. And yes, He might shake things up a, get, a, bit, up a bit and cause us to get out of our norm. But we don't or shouldn't push Him away in fear. He will take us as an unclean individual, and through our faith in Him, He makes us clean. And then ultimately, through the hope of the resurrection, He will raise us from the dead. And so to close out, I want us to jump real quick to Luke chapter 9, verse 20. After this long day of about faith, and believing who Jesus is, Jesus is with his disciples. And in verse 20, he asks them, But what about you? He asked, Who do you say I am? And we know this to be Peter's confession, and you can read on uh, and see that. But who do we say Jesus is? And what are we going to do about it? You know, they say in preaching that you are to calm or comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. Comfort the disturbed. Jesus calms those storms of life when we put our faith in him. Whatever trials or troubles we're going through, we cast our cares and burdens to Him. Disturb the comfortable. What are we going to do with Jesus? Are we going to let Him come in and shake things up, to shake our life out of the norm? Are we going to recognize that, yes, following Jesus is the best and greatest thing, but yes, following Him is going to cost me something. It might cost relationships, might cost friendships, might cost being comfortable doing what I enjoy. It might cost me money. It might cost me my career. But is our response to Jesus going to be like that of the Gerasenes, the town where they ask Jesus to leave? Or are we going to be like the disciples? Or maybe we're a little afraid of what it might cost us. We may not really know all the answers, but we stick with Jesus. We stick through it. If you're here tonight and you haven't answered that question of who do you say Jesus is, if you haven't entered into a relationship 
with Him through baptism and been forgiven of your sins? We want to help you with that tonight. We want to talk to you about that. If there's anything we can do for you this evening, if we can pray for you in any way, if we can encourage you in your walk in any way, please come now as we stand and sing.